You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, and co-host of Fox Hills Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker, and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Veronica will introduce our guest in a moment. And I can tell you that you want to listen on because we interview a lady who's got probably the best property data in the industry. And we talk about how economists and researchers and what data you should actually rely on. This is a cracking episode and we ask her some massive questions on just how dangerous data can be. That's a hard bit with top 10 lists that if you don't, If you don't explain it properly, it can look a little bit like rubbish data. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Bootcamp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. In this episode, we pick the brains of Nerida Connersby, Chief Economist for the REA Group, which incorporates the familiar websites realestate.com.au and realcommercial.com.au, amongst others. Nerida has more than 20 years of property research experience and appears every fortnight on ABC News Breakfast, every Tuesday on Your Money, which is formerly Sky News business. In fact, I've passed her in the hallway there many, many times. She writes a fortnightly column for The Australian and is the property commentator for the Eureka Report. She's also quoted and appears in a wide range of media outlets throughout Asia Pacific. Nerida is the Deputy Chair of the Construction Forecasting Council and is an advisor to fintech startup BrickX. And if you remember, we actually interviewed Anthony Millett. And also she is an advisor for Skelton Projects, a Melbourne-based developer. Nerida also provides updates on property market conditions to major government bodies. Most recently, she joined the board of Kid Nest, a childcare startup, and joined the South East Queensland Housing Supply Expert Panel. And to back up this impressive <laughs> resume, Nerida holds a Bachelor of Commerce with honours and a Masters of Commerce, majoring in econometrics from the University of Melbourne. Thank you so much for joining us, Nerida. We are very much looking forward to some insights from you today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hi, Nerida. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate you giving us your time. Um, I mean, you know, real estate economy, you, the main, you know, obviously massive data providers and, you know, massive goliaths in the property industry. So thank you. Just going back to what the last comment was there around what you studied back in your early days. Did you study property, you know, and why do all the media love economists, I guess, with property? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have a, I guess, a traditional economist career. Mm-hmm. And I did have a traditional economist's degree. So I did a master's at Melbourne Uni and mm. um, started off working for Ian Harper at, at the Melbourne Business School as a research assistant. Um, but I graduated in the early 90s and mm-hmm. there were no jobs and it was really bad in Melbourne. And so I think at the time, I don't think I did at the time, I got an offer from um, the the federal government to work mm-hmm. at Department of Transport. And then I also got an offer for a firm in Melbourne that did uh, forecasting for shopping centres primarily. So um, turnover forecasting, so sales turnover mm-hmm. forecasting. So um, I got into property that way and it was, um, you know, and then and then it just got it stuck and I really enjoyed it and found it fascinating. And, um, and at the time, you know, property wasn't seen as the coolest place to be. You know, it was really um, most of my peers were going off to investment banks or they were going to government or, you know, to, to banking or, you know, whatever, but they were, you know, they were doing kind of more traditional roles and this wasn't, but, um, you know, now it's served me really well because I've, I've come out at the end of it with, you know, 20 plus years experience in property at a time when people are, are quite obsessed by it. I think that's the key <laughs> point there, 20 years experience, right? And now commenting on property. You know, I find that a lot of media outlets want to get economists' opinion on property, but, you know, they haven't got 20 years working in property. So, you know, why do they go to economists who haven't really, you know, do they don't study property? How does that all work, you know? Yeah, I mean, some 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 are really good. Like, you know, you can tell that they understand the fundamentals, but, you know, you do find some of them try to treat property like equities mm. or, you know, like a bond or, you know, they, they don't look at it the same way as, as people who have been in the industry for a long time. So they don't understand 
um, particularly the what the differences you know, how, how diverse property is, you yeah. know, when you're talking, you know, when we're talking Sydney right now, um, you know, it's quite different to what we're seeing in Hobart, for example, mm-hmm. if you, you're talking Perth, you know, Perth, if you read the headlines, looks bad news for a long time, but you go to Cottesloe and we're, we're seeing really decent growth in both rents and also values. So, yeah. you know, it is highly diverse. And, um, and also, I guess, the emotional appeal of property that, you know, if you're buying Facebook shares, you know, you're, you're kind of buying them because, you know, of p- perhaps investment fund, you know, likely yep. because of investment yep. fundamentals. But, you know, the drivers of, of buying a home and particularly an owner-occupier yep. is, is often nothing to do with, with the investment fundamentals. It's about, you know, family or it's about your kid's school or, yeah. you so, know, you really so love good. the area or, or whatever. You've, you've touched on the two big points, right? Markets within markets within markets. And so when you talk about the property market, it's pretty pointless. But if you talk about Cottesloe housing market, that's a different conversation. So I think you're right. I think a lot of economists do like to play the, oh, prop Australian property market's going to fall 11%. Well, what does that mean? People don't buy the Australian property market. They buy a house in Cottesloe. Yeah. yeah. And your other big point there was around home ownership. And that drives a bigger portion of the market than the investor market, you know, maybe 70%. So if you don't understand how owner occupiers think and what they really want, how are you going to understand the, the property market? Before you joined REA, did you understand, you know, the markets within markets as much as you do now? Because, you know, seeing access to all the data that you have now, that's probably helps you to see what people are actually doing. Yeah, I mean, it blows me away how much data we have. We um, One of the things that is really exciting for us is the search data, or for me, really. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone else loves it too internally. But but for me, the um, the search data is what I find so fascinating because, you know, we, we kind of have, you know, me, people in property know that, you know, being near a good school, you know, probably makes sense and is yeah. good for value or, you know, a train station. But, you know, we can we can see that, you know, we can see that some areas um, people are far more drawn to. Um, you know, we can see switching behaviour, you know, when prices get too expensive in a suburb, we can see people move away. Like Manly was a good example. It hit three mil median. Um, we started to see search activity move inland in the northern beaches. Oh, so, no, I love that. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And it's also yeah. like, you, you know it, you kind of know it, mm. and, you know, and, and probably, you know, and for sure, if you spoke to a real estate agent in the area, they'd be like, oh, you know, Manly's getting a bit exy. Yeah, we're yeah. seeing people go to, you know, Narrabeen or not Narrabeen, probably not, but Lambie but, Heights. But, no, yeah. but that's really, mm. it's the ripple, ripple effect, right? Yeah. So, you know, one suburb becomes, and this is what happens in a boom, is one suburb becomes too expensive. People get priced out. They miss out at auctions. Where do they go shopping? The next suburb. And then they go there and then that gets too expensive, et cetera. So you're, you're, you're saying that you can actually see... Lots of data that proves that. And you can see it going back again the other direction. Right now. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say, we can see Manly's gone back up the list. So, you know, now that prices are dropping, all premium premium Sydney suburbs are being pushed back up the list, which they really dropped out the last couple of years as people were a little bit fearful about what was happening there and, you know, looking for cheaper options. Have you got any reports on this? We do. We do a property outlook report every quarter. Um, And then we're constantly putting out data um, stories. So we do data stories on our site. We do data stories with with News Corp, obviously, where, you know, majority owned by News Corp. So we do a lot with News Corp. But I mean, Um, on the actual data of the ripple effect going out um, and search over the boom. Well, I mean, we have have data definitely, yeah, if you look at our, the most popular suburbs on our site. So when we talk about most popular suburbs, it's high views per listing. So very, very high views per listing. And if you looked at the top 10 list Two, even probably twelve, probably two years ago, you'd mm. see a lot of Central Coast suburbs on that list. Mm. Um, you'd see definitely see, see a Lambie Heights. That was <laughs> that was one that was featuring for quite some time. But mm. um, but now it's Manly and it's Paddington, and you know right. we're really seeing pretty expensive Sydney back on the back on top. I want to get back to this, but the top ten list is something. It's a little bit of a bugbear of mine, just quietly, because you know I know that. Everyone loves a top 10. Oh, top 10. And real estate agents love it too because I've been into open houses and I've had the agents waving under my nose, you know, a printout of some report and it might have been an REA one. And it's like, look, you know, this suburb is, is top 10 searched on, on realestate.com.au, see how popular it is. And I'm like, okay, can we get a bit of context with that? And oh, that's great. And when was that? I and mean, it might have been three years yeah. ago. It was on one report and they're, they're, they're flashing it about. <laughs> 
And it does irritate me. I mean, one list, I was actually doing a little bit of research for this interview and, you know, I was looking at one of your articles and in there is a top 10 report and Birchgrove is on there. I know yeah. Birchgrove very, very well. And Birchgrove is a tiny suburb. And, you know, if there are 10 listings, then... Well, there might be only three listings, in which case you've got a lot of people that will always look, and if there's only three, but there might be ten, you know, the next month, and it could go down to one, and if it happens to be the month when there's only one, it's going to look like it's right at the top of the list, you know. And so, therefore, all this data or these lists, I guess, don't tell the story behind why that place is on the list, and I find that a little bit infuriating and frustrating. Yeah, I no, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I think the thing is that with our data sets, we always make sure that they are statistically significant. So, yeah. you know, we, we're very careful that we don't quote suburbs where there's been two listings, you know, for example. We always <laughs> try to make sure we have the volume um, there. We also try to make sure that we've got a really good time series available so we're not talking this week we're talking, you know, six months. So I suppose that's the first point. Um, but uh, but the other point is, I you know, without context, it is yep. it is really frustrating. Like I know, you know, I'll sometimes be given the top 10 growth suburbs and, you know, I'm looking at them and they're places like Garfield, for example, in, in Melbourne. And, and I know for sure Garfield's not a red hot suburb that everyone's wanting to move to. It's a suburb where there's been massive subdivisions and lots of new housing. So, you know, so it's, it's gone up. But, yeah. you know, strictly, it's, it's, it's true. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. the median's gone up. Yeah. Like, there's no doubt. There's no, but, you know, so, but you do need the context. And so I think that's the, that's the hard bit with top 10 lists, that mm. if you don't, if you don't explain it properly, it can look a little bit like rubbish data. Um, or I think too, yeah, or, or if your statistical analysis is a little bit dodgy. I mean, it's interesting. It is interesting looking at it because sometimes we'll see things pop up that, they just don't make sense. And, and I think that's also a lot of my job is, you know, I've got, we've got the data teams, in, you know, we've got really big data teams in place, push pulling things together. And and my job is a lot of just, well, what, you know, what, what, what does this mean? Why is this happening? Mm. And, you know, we often get quite surprising results and, um, and, you know, and, and those surprising results sometimes make sense and sometimes they don't. But, you know, when, when you can kind of explain it or, you know, you can or you can talk to a local agent in the area or someone who lives in the area, mm. uh, it does give you quite unique insight. So it's so one recent example, you know, I talked about Sydney and how premium suburbs are doing really well. Um, Winston Hills popped up on the top 10 list and, you know, Winston Hills, Western Sydney, it's it's you know, it's not that expensive and, you know, I couldn't kind of work out what was happening. But, you know, when I had a bit more of a dig deep into what was, ha you know, trying to work out what was happening, it, it looked like an area with really good schools. And, you know, I've, I, I think that was probably the driver. You know, there didn't look like there was any major infrastructure projects. Sometimes a shopping centre redevelopment can kind of make a difference. Yeah. But, you know, there's usually something going on that leads to this, you know, this rush of activity. And the, I suppose the other thing too, you know, when we talk about popular suburbs, we're not talking about 10 more people looking in that yeah. sub suburb we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of clicks like it's it's you know if, if you look at the number of people searching our buy site you know it's you know millions a month you know it's mm. not it's not me doing a survey of real estate agents or my gut feel you know like it's it is really backed by big data and mm. You know, so I like to think our data is the best. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> well, it's, quite, it's quite different data in the sense yeah, that, you know, different. you go to CoreLogical, you go to, you know, yep. you know, any of those big data houses, Backwards. for instance. There's really only two big data houses, aren't there? I mean, in terms of property data, there's like APM and, and CoreLogic. And pretty much any data that you get hold of comes via one of them and, and they come via the ABS. To yeah, a large degree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or the value of general. Yeah. 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 So yeah. they come from a singular source and it's then filtered through to them and their various treatments of that data, et cetera, et cetera. And then on to their consumers and, and what they do with the data. Whereas what you're doing is actually, I, I presume you're looking at that data as well, but you're also overlaying that with actual behaviour of people that are either just curious about property and love sitting online and looking at listings I imagine there's a bit of that as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> property porn. Yeah, the property porn <laughs> thing. Um, you know, but it's actual consumer behaviour, isn't it? And so here we are. We've all signed up for this. You know, we didn't like the Australia card. Or oh, you guys are probably too young to know the Australia. You might you might remember it, but you know the Australia card that that Hawke wanted to bring in in the eighties. 
We all Wasn't argued. Born. Well, we all uh, <laughs> shut up. We all argued against it. Well, I didn't. I, I can't remember to be honest whether I argued against it. But we we all Australians didn't like it because it was basically um, put forward as an attack on our privacy. And look at us now. Oh, we, yeah. we have online activity. Google those. Yeah. What is it, a Google Home in your house? You have Alexa in your house. We're actually, we've got Siri in our hands. We're willingly giving away all this free information about ourselves and our privacy is kaput. But anyway, that's just a bit of a side issue. So you've got access to this stuff. I mean, how is that turned into something valuable? How do you work out really what's what sentiment, what are lead indicators, you know what I mean? Like where does this all make sense and how does this really make your understanding of what's happening in the property market more insightful. Yeah, so I, I guess, you know, the big thing, it is forward looking and it's not looking back. And, you know, we bought a company called Home Track recently. So we've kind of, you know, we do, we've got our own internal core logic now. And so we're getting a lot more pricing data and, uh, you know, developing our own ind- index and all of those things. And it's great to have that. But um, the thing with the the search data is it, the longer I've been at REA, the more I've seen how predictive it's been, but yeah. it's not an exact science. Mm. So, you know, it's not a done deal to say, you know, in, in Perth at the moment, we always see Shenton Park as the most in-demand suburb in Perth. But <laughs> Shenton Park, yeah, it's going okay, but it's not going as well as Cottesloe, which is going yeah. crazy. So, you know, so it kind of, it doesn't always hold, but there's been a number of instances where, you know, we, we've picked it. Like when we... we looked at Hobart, you know, Hobart was one that we could see clearly on views per listing, a, a massive increase from about 2014. And yeah. um, and when we saw it, when I joined REA, which was three years ago, 2016, I, you know, and they, they showed me the data, I was like, well, this is incredible. And it was incredible because Perth, no, sorry, Hobart at the time was going nowhere. And, you know, people were very suspicious about Hobart. Mm. You know, no, everyone's yeah. like, oh, yeah, if there's any activity there, everyone's just speculating. There's nothing going oh, on there. Oh, just still suspicious about Hobart, <laughs> <Yeah. Frank>, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, but, you know, then Hobart went on to, to yeah. achieve massive growth. Yeah. And, you know, and you look at then you look at the Hobart economy and it, it's doing pretty well. And, and it's moving from a government-run agri-type economy to, you know, tourism, education. And so there's been this big change. And it's also a small economy, so it doesn't, you know, when you look at these little economies, it doesn't take much to really give them a boost and and really change the Mm. way that they behave. Um, So Hobart was a really good one. Um, Just on that though, so you saw activity in terms of searches increase from as early as 2014. There's obviously a period of time, a lag time, before you start seeing that play out. What was triggering those searches in 2014? You know I, I think it was, you know, I, I, I do think that it obviously coincided, well, not obviously, but it seemed to coincide with the economic transition that Hobart was undertaking. And um, I remember going to Hobart in 2013. I think I haven't, I haven't been to Hobart that often, I've only been a couple of times, but I did go in 2013. And I remember at the time Mona had been open not that long, you know, it was still fairly new, but, you know, people were very excited about Mona and, um, and, and it really started to seem, it really was starting to change tourism for the area. It was starting to change um, the restaurant culture there. The foodie culture was really starting to open up. Um, the arts culture, obviously. Um, the other thing too, that we noticed a boost in offshore searches, particularly from China. Yeah. And so that that then, you know, because Chinese don't search, they search either for investment or education. Mm-hmm. And and um, and there was a lot of tourism from yep. China going there. But then we found out the University of Tasmania had been doing a big campaign right, to yep. try and boost Chinese student numbers and and that seems to then oh, that does lead to increased demand for property. So, you know, there's all these things happening. I think that's that's one of the things with my my role. I'm not just looking at, you know, pure views per listing. I'm looking at the pricing data and I'm looking at rental demand. I'm looking at flows from yeah. you know coming out of you know <laughs> China mm. and then also we we're also looked you know, we always look at um, you know, flows from you know, we could see that a lot of search activity in Hobart was coming out of Melbourne, for example. Not not mm. that Sydney people don't get Hobart, but Melbourne people love Hobart. <laughs> Sydney so loves people Gold Coast. Investors <laughs> with money, right? And yeah, so yeah. you know, twenty fourteen was a different world, free free credit basically, interest mm. only loans, access as much as you want. Yep. You know, I want to invest. Oh, I've already got something in Sydney, Melbourne. Oh, let's go Hobart, Capital Cities. I went there on holidays. It was amazing. You know, and I guess I wonder whether you think, I've asked a question to someone else, whether you think that 
you know, there's certain people out there that love hotspots, right? I want to know this suburb's going to boom and X, Y, Z. <laughs> Have you ever noticed a connection with that type of, you know, these people with big databases of people who have big followings that, you know, follow them as gospel. Have you seen there's link between what they say and an impact on actual listings? Um, yeah, so we, we I do get called um, by, by the News Corp journalists and, you know, they'll be like, oh, someone said this is the next hotspot yeah. and, and we can check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I check and I'm like... Often they're not. So, no. like, but no, but that, like, often often that's maybe a local real estate agent trying to pump up the area or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But when we talk to, you know, some of the people that are really good are the buyer's agents. Mm. You know, a lot of them are really looking at massive, like you say, ma- massive amounts of data. They're looking at different indicators. Um, and, and what they come up with is kind of often quite similar to what we're seeing on site. They have to do a lot more work to get there because they're looking a lot, you know, they're having to kind of start from scratch, whereas we can just see yep. see the flows. But, yeah, a lot of them are really good. Like, I, yeah, and I remember looking at one of them, they were talking about, they do a, I can't remember who it was, but they, they do this, you know, buy-sell kind of analysis yeah. for their customers. Yep. And, yeah, it was, it was pretty spot on with what we were seeing. Well, that's right, because the people looking on the site, people browsing, probably a big portion of people actually thinking about buying at some point. That's not today. That could be buying, you know, there's br- some browsing just because they love it. Some browsing because they actually want to buy and they could be buying the next six months, two years, five years. Um, you've then got people thinking about selling. Um, you know, you've got real estate agents, you've got buyers agents, you've got, you know, people are just living in the area, just want to see what's happening in the market. So how do you take all that data out? Because the real data you want to care about is who's selling, who's buying. How do you figure out? Because you could, there must be machine learning and ways to look at that data and say, you're a browser, you're a buyer, you're a buyer in six months. Do you do that? We we, we can. I, I guess we have, so I'll talk about that in a sec. I guess the first point, though, is um, without a doubt, people looking to buy uh of behaving very, very differently from someone browsing. Yep. So, um, you know, I, I live Northern Beaches. Occasionally I'll go on and have a look and see what's for sale. But I might look maybe two weeks, gotcha. three weeks. Yep. I'm not on there clicking away every day, according to friends. Refresh, refresh. You know, like, <laughs> we and we can tell, like, buyers, uh, they're a on bit there. More, a bit more anxious. <laughs> Daily. Yeah. And they're forwarding and yeah. they're commenting and contacting, contacting agents. agents. Yeah, there you go. They're fully engaged in the process. So, so again, like when I started and I saw these very high views for listings in areas, I was very cautious because I was like, oh, are they just around? And, but, but then, it, you know, it kind of makes sense that they, they are, um, you know, the, the majority of clicks are probably coming from yeah. from someone who's highly engaged in a suburb and, and really looking to buy. So your top 10 lists of, of, you know, hot suburbs for searching, so your searching top 10 list, does that take into account that sort of activity or is it just purely clicks? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's views per listing. Um, Overlay of... Doesn't know we, we do, we do it. I mean, we do, we do it occasionally. So we sometimes will do most engaged... Suburbs, mm-hmm. and in those cases, we look at that more when we're looking at the kind of characteristics of people. So, when, when you know, we'll often talk about, um, you know, what types of suburbs do best, and you know, the types of suburbs that people are most highly engaged with tend to be places with good public transport, schools, and retail. You know, that kind of is holds true. If you're in Sydney, you're more, you know, beachside is more highly engaged than not beachside. So that we, we do it then, but when we're looking at when we, I guess it's probably an easier measure for us, and it's clean, you know. Mm. So I think that's the other thing too. Like we, we have established, we do have a price index, like CoreLogic have a price index, but when we when we started looking at um, the search behaviour, we tried we we put it out as an index, and people didn't know what we were talking about, and we were trying to tell them this is really accurate, you know, we've done all this work and we're, you know, and they're just like, I don't know, what's an index? What does 101 mean for this, yeah. this you know, what does, Sydney's at 103, what does that mean? And what's the median? And then we'd like to know the median. And, you know, it was really a, a hard message. So I guess we, we're kind of up a little bit on in that, with particularly with the media that I'm dealing with that tends to be more top 10 and yeah. what's happening now and what's the next move and, you know, why is Port Augusta going up? You know, like the people were kind of, you know, it's, a bit, it's more immediate then perhaps if, if I was in a more academic setting yeah. where I would have the time and resources and the modelling and, you know, like being able to really sit down and, 
do a yeah. thesis, <laughs> you know, like I suppose yeah. that's, a, that's a challenge that we have in terms of, I guess, the media cycle versus what would be the purest and best way to, to an, uh, analyse this data. Which, which so, is hard. I mean, I always look at this as sort of a bit like, you know, existing on a, on a diet of chips and lollies versus one of an actual, you know, even if you want to go for the fast food analogy, at least a hamburger with some, some a few different groups in it. Um, and we all, you know, this is insatiable demand for content and, and we all want headlines and we all want to make decisions really quickly and, and, and we'd really rather not waste a lot of time, and I use that word waste with inverted commas, you know, thinking too hard about our property decisions because really we've got lives to live and get on with it and so therefore top ten lists and hotspotting and all that sort of stuff is so compelling. Um, it's a bit of a danger. Like if you don't feed the beast then no one's going to pay you any attention. But at the same time, for consumers, i.e. listeners to this podcast and us, you know, it's it's really important to dig beneath that and understand the context and what you're saying. Um, and, and obviously know that it's not gospel because, mm. I, 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 you know, if you go to the invest tab on realestate.com.au, by the way, I don't know if you've ever gone and played around in that, listeners, don't go there. It's useless. Right. And I will tell you what, and I'm, I'm sure you're not going to disagree, Nerida. So, and I've many, many, many times I've looked at this. On the Invest tab, they have, you know, in varying times it changes slightly. It could be the top 10 um, suburbs for yield in the country. Yeah. It could be the top 10 suburbs for capital growth. Um, yesterday when I looked, it was the top 10 or top five um, suburbs and property types for capital growth, which is more specific and really, really interesting, and the top 10, so the top five for cash flow, right? So of the top five for property types and capital growth, you've got number one and number two was, um, I hope I've never heard of, Forest Dale in WA, right? And so three-bedroom houses was number one, number two was four-bedroom houses. And if you look and then you go into actually the data, there's not a lot that have sold. And in fact, there's only data that goes back a couple of years anyway. And you actually look at what's increasing in value and it's actually, the, you know, the development sites. Mm. And so, it's a common one for price growth. Yeah, mm, absolutely. Yeah. Because, of course, the zoning change means that suddenly you've got a usage change on the land and then you've got a different type of buyer that wants it and it's, it's more valuable, right? And so I guess what gets me is that when you've got those lists that are obviously it saves time to just have them generated by algorithms and whatever and then there's the top two. And the third one was um, I think it was East in Melbourne anyway, a, um, apartments. And then the bottom two were a suburb in um, Victoria called Mickleman. A new, um, new home area. Yeah, new, exactly. Mm. A new home area. So, of course, if you've only got recent sales in that area because it, before then it was farmland mm. and it's like, oh, they're all massive prices because there was nothing before. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's being uh, relayed as huge growth. And so novice and ill-informed and, and, and people who really don't know any better can look at that as a justification for going to buy their, their three bedroom home in Mickleman. Um, yeah, I mean, do you I, know I, what I mean? Suppose, you know, I, don't, I, I mean, I'm sure there are investors that look at one point of data and go buy, but yeah. there are. You, I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there are. <laughs> but I mean, but I, I do hope that, you know, that, you know, the best, I mean, I don't hope, but, you know, the best investors <laughs> for sure yeah. are not basing their judgment on one media article yeah. you know yeah. that, I, I think that is a, if it's so useless why is it I guess it's not always useless like I think um definitely Mickleham you're not going to buy there as an investment and and even the other thing that I'm always telling people is even price growth historically there's no guarantee of future price mm. growth anyway yep. so you you probably do need to be pretty. To be honest, <laughs> it's probably <laughs> yeah. You know, well, it's actually good because if you look at then the next suburb, yeah. that's probably the one to go. Exactly. Next. Yeah. So, it's, it's a. It's actually a leading indication yes. to say not look there. Don't look, look there. Near there. Yes. That yeah. Bolted. Totally. Yeah. So I think I think people they do need to be careful with data, and they need to yeah. make sure that they obviously don't base their decisions purely on data points, and they do look at commentary that people write and. Mm. Um, and, and there's tons of, you know, there's so much information out there and not so just data. It is good mm. and bad. And it's also sometimes, and sometimes I see some commentators with some absolute rubbish comments and using bad data, bad data. And even people I have a lot of respect for coming out with just some outrageous comments. And I know there was one recently on, on <laughs> listing, on listing volumes and mm. 
you know, if anyone knows listing volumes, it's us because we're tracking them to the nth degree because, yeah. you know, in the end, what happens to listings, you know, yeah. determines our revenue. So, mm. you know, we're, we're super careful. And um, there was a report out last week that someone said listing volumes in Sydney had jumped by 40%. Yeah. And that, that means our revenue has jumped by 40%. <laughs> I'm like, oh, our EA That's should great. be having a good year. But, I mean, we're <laughs> having a decent year, but we're not having a 40% uplift no. in listings yeah. in Sydney like this. No yep. way. But the, the commentator was trying to make out that there was such distress in Sydney that there was yeah. this, this big jump in activity. And, and I thought, God, anyone reading that, they would have been, oh, well, that backs up my opinion that the exactly. Sydney market market yep. stuffed. And I mean, that and happened yesterday with Neil, Nigel Slattery at, uh, you know, saying the defaults on... And can you I know, just say also we're recording this in February and we may not release it till later, right. so yeah. you just bear this in mind. Yeah, but I mean he was basically saying the defaults were you know forty percent on house and land packages and or twenty five percent and someone else said forty and mm. you know you could take that as well every house and land package is defaulting at forty percent and it's like well his projects might be you know <laughs> yeah and he's one of the developers and he's doing a hundred lots rather than ten thousand lots and you know it's just extremely dangerous. I think what Veronica is kind of saying there is, is that you know you can read these reports and people will flick over magazines and go this is the hot spot and then mm. the person who's writing that report or doing that is basically using a lot of the time they're on floor data yep and they're not got they haven't really gone through and built amazing cases they've just gone and picked a few pieces and said look that's enough we've got it out there to produce the content i'd like to just <laughs> talk about the search because i think it is an amazing thing to have right if i could see who's searching what how are they behaving mm. what are they searching what time you know what how does media play into it what percentage of home buyers are using real estate company? Because I know that's one of your marketing fields where, you know, like your property's not on real estate company, you're not on the market yeah. or whatever. What percentage of people are actually using real estate company to buy? Um, well, we know, sorry, I should know this off the top of my head. Um, we do have the three times the audience of our next major competitor. Yeah. So you be the starting with a D. Yeah, starting um, with a D. Um, and we can an say you're not sponsored by anybody. No, you're not sponsored. Okay. Um, the and green then, one. And then, and then, yeah, million. I mean, what do we have? I, I think it's. I will look it up for you. But so, I, yeah, well, it's it's millions. It's, There's millions of people on the site every month. Yeah, yeah. you know, so we, know, we know for sure. Know, but that's eighty percent, ninety percent of home buyers must be because end of the day, you've. Most, like you've got to go to real estate company. You like you were saying, you're three times more than domain. Where else are you going to go? Like somewhere else. So. My underst my worry is, is though that you know that data is so you know end of the day Australia is is our biggest property or asset you know seven trillion dollars yep. three times super. Well, haven't we just shaved ten percent off that? Shaved it off, but <laughs> it's um, point three trillion dollars. <laughs> I think it was seven point seven. Now it's down to seven. Um, but you know it's seven trillion dollars. You know our super industries two. You know three uh, shares two three. You know it's it's huge, right? You've got the best data out there by a, you know a huge margin on understanding what's happening with buyers. Um, and that, that data is, I guess, so much, you know, you can actually see in real time how things are moving. You know, is, is anyone kind of coming to real estate and you're saying, look, you've almost got like inside information on the market here and you've got to be really careful how you manage that and how the people who see that data, you know, act on that because you kind of got you know, highly valuable things that you've only the one who's got it. You know what I mean? On, on Australia's biggest asset. Is there kind of controls around who can see this stuff within real estate to come to you? No, I mean, we're, we're very free with that data. Like we, we put, put it up on our site. You know, we've got interactive infographics where you can check the listing in your suburb. You know, we, we've, we're very open with it. Um, but we, I can't see who's, who are those people. Are they Sydney? Are they Melbourne? How old are they? What are they? Well, no, we can, we can, tell, we can track IP addresses so we know where they're searching from. We can't tell age and um, unless they're logged in. So, you know, around 20% of people log in to our site. So we, we, we can get a bit better insight on, you can on that match group. That IP address to other data. Like yeah, Facebook we accounts can. Yeah, we, can, we can. Do... I mean, we don't use Facebook for that reason. I mean, we are. I mean, there's a lot of privacy issues too around data. So we're yep. very careful with that. Being such a block. So we're very careful. I guess, you know, we do have big data science teams and, and they've done quite a bit of work modelling behaviour. So, yep. you know, they they can tell who is likely to be a first home buyer based on their search behaviour, based on how they look in certain areas mm. and the way they they forward to people. You know, like they can there's lots of things that they look at, but they can kind of work it out. 
Um, they can tell an investor in the same way. So they, they, they can do it. I guess one of the problems we have is is not that we don't have this ridiculous amount of data and it's incredibly value, valuable because it's such an amazing place to be and it's it's getting the really good data people in the house to be able to to get that data out. They're working for Facebook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, inter- uh, we do have very good data people, but the vol- like trying to get them, they're, they're yeah. just not that many of them. Because no. like, well, it's, it's the- a new area. Like it's not. Well, the, the world's data, right? It's a game of data now. So yeah. whether you're working in Amazon or Facebook or Google or whoever you are, everyone wants that data. I mean, that's the business is based on data advertisements. You can sell other products, et cetera. The more you know about me, realestate.com to you, the better. And I, I guess it's just with... When you're talking about an investment asset, it's just, you're actually talking about being able to make money. So I, not only can I make money off selling you things, I can make money off basically predicting your behavior. I just, I guess I, I just worry that that, you know, if I was an investor, I'd want to see your data. And I guess that's, you know, there has to be some type of control around who can see the good stuff because otherwise they may use But it also for... then the market becomes biased because of that data, you know, yeah, like, and I, and I, I, I think that's, problem, isn't it? <laughs> it is yeah. a problem because I know... You know, I've been talking about Hobart for a long time now and it, and it keeps going and I'm thinking, God, maybe I should just quieten down a bit. But, yeah, I'm, of course I'm not driving the whole market, but, you know, it, it does have that flow and ripple effect that the more people talk about it, it gets this kind of um, excitement around 100%. an area and people start – I mean, a bit, it's not as bad as Bitcoin. That was the extreme, but, you know, it, it, it can well, happen it in happens. property. It's been, you know, you've talked – there's been very I mean, famous – Mining towns. I mean, mining yeah. towns was a key example that, you know, people tipped – you know, millions and million, billions probably into to buying mining town suburbs and, and got terribly burnt. So and you just have to type in pump and dump into Google and you can pretty much understand. It's a pretty famous strategy of people who want to manipulate markets. And what you would do is you would basically, um, you've got a following, you've got a voice, you've got an ability to impact people on scale through your, you know, your words basically. And what you do is you go and buy in the mining town. I go buy in Port Hedland, I buy it for $50,000 and then I wait for a bit of, you know, good infrastructure getting announced. And then I go bang, bang, bang. And I put out lots of information. Now, like, I, I know that market's very small. So if I can tip the needle by creating additional demand for those houses, I create competition. If I create competition, then I start creating price growth. And once I've got all the ingredients, I then I just have to wait for the, and start and let the frenzy happen. And I, you know, and it's true. And it's what it happened, in like Bitcoin. You, yeah. <laughs> it happened in Bitcoin. It happened in everything. Yeah. And I personally believe that it's happened in property and we just haven't talked about it. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just something that I guess. Uh, in people- terms of people buying property in general, or do you think? In- well, I think Hobart's a really good example of this because, and a lot of people I know that tipped Hobart are denying that they've got that much influence. And I'm like, them individually may not have that influence, but certainly when as a cohort, everyone starts talking about it, then you've got the data reflecting the fact that some people have been talking about it and you've got a small population or a small um, area there. So therefore any, any change is, is quite monumental, particularly coming off such a low base, you know what I mean? So then the needle turns, like you say, and, and it's like, oh, there's something happening there. Then you start reporting on it, you know what I mean? And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Look, I think, I mean, Hobart's different because it 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 looked like speculation at mm. the beginning, but it then the economic growth story was was the driver. I, I agree though that the you growth can as well, um, started because you you're an, you're a home buyer in Hobart. You weren't concerned. If I was a first home buyer living there, I wasn't concerned about prices running away from me. And that's what that fear of missing out is what hit in the Sydney market. Mm. Yeah, hit Hobart. definitely hit. And so oh, your young yeah. families in Hobart are going. God, I might be going to be able to get a kid. My parent, my kids aren't going to be able to ever own a property and I'm going to have to leave Hobart. And then that's what was part of the boom. And that's what's, that's where Hobart really kicked is home buyers in Hobart started buying, right? People who live there. So what data do we have in terms of the proportion of investors versus home buyers? Uh, we don't have that. I know. We can't tell. I didn't give you that yeah. <laughs> heads up on that one. But I mean, that that's what we need to know because I mean, the yeah. reality is once the needle tips although, over. Although Hobart has a rental crisis, so there's actually not enough mm. investment housing. So, mm, um, I mean, Hobart, the other thing with Hobart, which is also the, really the big impact is that they haven't built much. And if you look over the last decade, they've built hardly anything. Right, so so there's a you demand. not only had mm. economic growth, you had 
Sure, you had investors coming out of Sydney and well, probably more Melbourne. Yep. Um, but you also had no housing. So, you know, now we're in a situation in Hobart, prices have gone berserk, rental levels are going berserk, the rental vacancy level is, you know, next to zero, you've got a homeless problem. So, you know, it, it's... And that's the home buyers buying because you're taking investment stock off. There's no new stock coming on the market, but let's say there's 100 properties and they're 30% of, 30 of them are owned by investors. When they sell, they sell to a home buyer. And that's where the home buyers are buying. That means less housing stock, which creates. Yeah. I mean, the other thing too, Airbnb also had an impact. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's just been a series of challenge. Oh. And, and it's not all positive. Like, I mean, you talk about, oh, I hope it's great. It's gone crazy. Mm. But like you said, Back if you're a so first home buyer, you're, you've been priced out. You know, if you're living on, you know, if you can't get a rental property and mm. you're living on the streets, you know, this is a, a problem with what, mm. yeah. And, and in re- many ways, the Tasmanian government didn't plan for what happened economically in, mm. in the state. So, I mean, that that is the other problem too, that things take property changes that will often take people by surprise. And, you know, we only, we, we could see, it, we can see it really clearly now with, um, you know, the, the federal budget that was done, you know, there was that one that was May very 2017. Home. Yeah, it yeah, was really, it was all, it was a panic around first home buyers. And mm-hmm. then yeah. suddenly investors evaporated, which we saw that 30% drop in investor lending mm. and yeah. first home buyers were back and they weren't back because of any government incentive. They were back because of state government incentives that that helped certainly in Sydney, but it was really because the market cooled and they felt a bit more comfortable and, you know, yeah. they, they were back in. So, you know, it is, it is hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think governments... Trying to do stuff at a federal level is is impossible for housing. Like I just, I, Ooh, I think. Can you it's... have a chat to the ALP? <laughs> <laughs> What's your thoughts on that while we're there? Because we have we have done lots about of talks around negative it. gearing, yeah, and negative capital gains gearing, tax, and... capital gains tax. But I mean, don't worry about all the other policies around franking credits and all that yeah. sort of mm. jazz. But just fundamentally, what you know, your personal belief around you know Labor's policy, whether it's a good idea, whether it's not, whether you agree or not, and yeah, what's your thoughts? I think that it, it's not, it's, there's a lot of problems with it. And there's a lot, a lot of the commentary has been around the effect on prices and, um, and modelling by both sides of government and independent consultants. I mean, so many people have done modelling on it and everyone said it'll take a hit on prices. So whether you're, you know, a bit more left-leaning, the, the, the decline's probably around 2%, more right-leaning, you're probably saying about 10%. So, you know, we know it'll take a hit on prices. And I, I think that's, you know, it's worrying in Sydney, but Maybe elsewhere, maybe not such a worry. So, but yeah, it's obviously a concern. Um, yep. The bigger concern is around rental levels. So, you know, people are saying no, there will be no impacts on rent. But <laughs> realistically, take away investors. They're, the only people providing rental housing in Australia are mum and dad investors. Yep. There's no one else. Take them Chinese away. Investors. Well, they've gone yep. as yep. well. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Ch- well, offshore or local yep. investors. And, and they're, they're mum and dad investors out of China as yep. well. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're pulled back. So you pull back the supply of rental housing. You still got population growth. Like why, why wouldn't rents go up? Like there's no reason to say. And (laughs) And I've been doing a lot of research on this actually. And it is quite funny because there's this economic theory that for every investor that sells a property, a first home buyer buys it. And that first home buyer was a renter and therefore that's, it's, it's a nil effect. And it's like, except for the fact that you know, find a, a release this report oh, a couple of years ago now. It basically said that in WA, for instance, 70% of first home buyers live at home while they're saving a deposit. And that was the highest proportion. And in Queensland, it was 31%. And then so everywhere else is somewhere between 31 and 70% of first home buyers are actually living at home. So they buy an investment property off an investor. They're not reducing the rental pool. You know, like they're not having any impact on the demand for rental accommodation. And, and that's just... That sec- I mean, what about the first home buyers that are currently sharing, house sharing, mm. and all that sort of stuff? I mean, it's well, so- someone arriving from another city. Yeah, you know, yes. like you yeah. coming. I mean, a lot of rental activity is. You know, I moved to Sydney three years ago. We didn't buy straight up, and there's exactly. no way we were moving yeah. to Sydney and buying a house straight up. You know, we spent a year renting and we worked it out. You and know? it doesn't even touch on population growth, as you mentioned no. just then. So it's it's this economic theory. And I love that. You know, you, oh yeah, that's perfect. Set, until you actually start thinking a little bit further about it, and yet. You know, and I've read uh, all the Grattan Institute, you know, commentary on this and, and, you know, a lot of these highly respected think tanks, you know, 
And I'm like, oh my God, guys, you know, there's these massive blind spots. I think it's, and look, I'm very left leaning in a, in a lot of my, my thinking and my ideas, but I'm not on this. I just think that they're absolutely blind to the real effects, the real impacts. But that, that whole idea of, you know, first time buyers. Yeah. I mean, um, that doesn't even barely make sense. No, I, so is there <laughs> any other kind of points that you said there, you know, obviously around, you know, price falls is going to happen at some level impacts on rental. Was there any other things that you... Yeah, I mean, and also regional towns. So yep. if you look at Wagga, you know, Wagga has a very large rental. Um, a lot of people rent. And the yeah. reason they rent is not because they hate Wagga, it's because they're not there for long. You know, mm. they may be there for defence no, or working at the hospital yep. or yep. education. And um, and Wagga doesn't need new housing. So, you know, the the new the ARP policy will, will apply. Negative gear, gearing will apply to new homes, not existing. Mm-hmm. So, yep. you know, you then have a situation... Fine, maybe for Sydney or Melbourne, but what happens in Wagga with renters there? Yeah, that's a really good point. And if they're lower income, Mm. you know, and I suppose the other thing with rent is that renters are already up up against it in terms of market conditions that, you know, if you were renting, you know, I always give this example of, you know, Richmond in Melbourne. If if you bought a home in Richmond in Melbourne um, 10 years ago, um, you're probably paying the same off your home loan. You know, there's probably been no impact on your monthly payments. But if you were renting in Richmond 10 years ago and you were still renting now, you'd be paying more than double yeah. on your rent. So, you know, you've got a situation where long-term renters are already at a disadvantage in that they they are very susceptible to market forces. They hit yeah. retirement and if you don't own your own home 100%. and you're still paying rent. And, yeah. you know, so renters, are you don't need much of a shift in rental values to really take a... a and yeah, they're already vulnerable, right? They're, they're very, already they're not... vul- and they're more likely. You know, if you're a single parent, you're more likely to rent. 100%. If you're low income, yeah. you're more likely to rent. You know, they're not the yeah. sort of people that you you really want to stuff around too much on their living expenses. Mm. So, so we need to be um, really careful with we need to be how really we careful. treat yeah. and the people who do and help not, them. And a lot of them aren't in, in a situation to even buy a home. You know, they're yeah. not. They're not. They're not. They can't get the deposit together. They. Yeah, so it's it's this sort of utopian ideal that we can all buy a home as long as investors don't buy. Yes. And it's like, well, actually, that's not going to work. Um, Another thing that that I noticed too, and this is two pieces of data which are equally true, but which is more important, right? So Morrison got fact-checked on the ABC for for saying 66.6% of um, income owners up to uh, earning under 80 thousand dollars taxable income are negative gearing. Now he misquoted a stat. The stat is 66.6%. So exactly one, two thirds, exactly of those taxpayers who claim negative gearing have a taxable income of 80,000 or less. Now that's the correct stat, right? Now those who are supporting a change are saying, but that's only 8% of those taxpayers right? And 18% of those earning over that are claiming. So therefore it's unfairly skewed because of the high income earners are able to claim more you know, more of them as a proportion of that segment of the market um, are using it. Whereas as a proportion of those income earners earning less is much smaller. Mm. So therefore it doesn't matter. But then when you look at the actual data, the amount of people actually claiming negative gearing, two thirds of those people actually claiming it earn taxable income, 80 grand or less. So that's, I can't believe that, you know, that isn't, more isn't made of that, you know, because the ALP is supposedly supporting the underdog and this is the underdog that is going to be most affected. The other thing is first home buyers who rent vest, they mm. won't be able to do it. Negative gearing will actually impact on their affordability. Um, and the other thing that really gets me is that in their policy, it says that, and I, I, I misquote here, but basically that if you have other investment income from other sources, be it shares or property, you can still negatively gear. So <laughs> I just, but what this is about though, I think in a way is a backdoor way of actually getting a change of capital gains tax concession because that's yeah, highly so water unpopular. It down. Yeah, the water and it everyone's down. focusing all their mm. attention on negative gearing and av- avoiding the very fact that the, the tax bill is going to go up 50%. For anybody who buys an investment property that's existing, and in fact, there's no mention around new either for that. There's that just goes through, and nobody's even paying any attention mm. to it. Yet that's actually the biggest issue here. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Actually, you could actually could be the another Trojan horse. Um, it's I a mean, massive Trojan. Sorry, yeah. I didn't yeah. want to hijack this interview yeah. on that because we've already done an episode on negative gearing, no, but I have been yeah. doing more research. But we so. haven't done something on the 
you know, the Royal Commission that has had a huge impact on what I do, you know, as a mortgage broker and, yeah, you know, yeah, the massive. industry and um, we're not sure how it's going to play out. We're very worried all brokers out there because we, we're concerned about kind of competition and um, whether this is just going to help the big fan, big ball be bigger. Mm. Um, what's your thoughts on, you know, what you've seen out there? I mean, obviously, real estate company, you own yep, brokers and you have your yep. own, um, you know, lending department. So... What's your thoughts on everything? Um, well, uh, putting the mortgage broking bit aside, I, gu I guess the, the the biggest surprise was that there was pretty much nothing on home loan lending. You know, it was it was very light on through um, the process. Uh, at the end of the report, yeah. You know, I mean, oh, yes. they basically said, you know, make sure you continue with what you're doing and keep doing that. Got to you. the banks and, <laughs> you know, and, and it was very different from this. I don't know if you remember, you know, when it was announced in December 2017, there was such alarmist commentary about what it would mean to getting a home loan. Like I, I know one of the the investment banks, maybe I don't, yes, or one of those yeah. groups were saying, right, from this Royal Commission, this is going to be the outcome. If you're someone on an 80 grand income, you're only going to be able to borrow 200,000. Yeah. Like this will be the outcome. Mm. And and it was funny that... Jonathan Mott. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure you said it, but I should look it up. But they, um, but you know, there was a lot of, you know, really alarmist things that, yeah. you know, everyone will just find it impossible and this is the end of the property market. And, um, and you know, for sure banks responded quickly and they started clamping down on people's hmm. detail on everything. And that, you know, is responsible lending. That all makes hmm. sense. And it's probably, it's not actually a bad thing, but... Um, but, you know, it was, it was quite interesting to see then through the Royal Commission that home loan lending didn't get much. Yep. It, it did, but then the mortgage broking business did. And, um, and I think what was alarming with the recommendation was the one around getting consumers to pay for that advice. And the reason being is that we know how popular mortgage brokers are for people. You know, more than 50% of loans are written through a mortgage broker. Um, but it, when you look at who broker, it's more likely to be a younger person. And that yep. makes sense because when you're, 20, you know, in your twenties or early thirties and you're looking to mm. get a loan, you don't know the process. You're yep. probably, you're, you are distrustful of the big four. You know, we know yep. that, um, <laughs> With good that reason. Reason. So true. <laughs> and even more so now, <laughs> but you know, we know younger people love an online process, you know, that, and big fours don't offer such an online process as such mm -hmm. as some of the others. So, so I think that that's the and worry. And they need more and guidance. And, they need more guidance. And, and they, you know, want to see that personal relationship. They haven't grown up loving their bank manager. You know, they haven't been with ANZ for 25 years, never left ANZ, always walked into the branch and got their mortgage. So I think that's a really good point. Mm. Yeah. And I they're mean, probably also not, yeah, the relationship would be the big one. Yeah. You know, if you've had several loans through ANZ, then they're probably ticking the boxes pretty quick. Whereas... Mm. You're walking as a first home buyer, and especially now with the responsible lending, you, you are having to give so much information, and having a mortgage broker walk you through that, yeah, mm. you know, is, is a good thing. So I think that upfront payment, I, you know, the government, the Morrison government, did say that they didn't recommend that. They said the bank should pay. So I think that that's at least a positive. Um, and then if around the trailing the commissions, yeah, yeah, it is. There's a lot still. I mean, the other thing is the trailing commission. So I know talking to our guys, they think, yeah, they think the percentage payment from banks will probably go up. So whether that happens, I'm, I'm not sure. But when they look at New Zealand, that's what happened. I think they went from a trailing commission to, you know, a smaller upfront plus a trailing commission to a, a much larger upfront payment Yeah. And, and scrap the trailing commission. Yeah, if that happens, that would be fine. I mean, end of the day that would be okay. There is actually unintended consequences of that model. And this is the reason why they went down the trail route early was because they, it used to be a big upfront. And then what they would see is that there were people would leave, um, leave one bank and go to another yes. bank, you yes. know, because there was no incentive for the broker to provide an ongoing service. And unfortunately, and then also once the loan was set up, the broker wasn't getting paid anything. And so what would happen is if the clients would call, the broker would say, well, I'm not actually receiving anything for this. And, you know, and it was creating problems there as well. So what they said is the bank said, look, let's de-risk ourselves. Let's pay a lower upfront, which means less for the bank. And we'll pay you the rest of your money over a few years, because that means that you'll have something to get paid to provide ongoing service. It'll also stop churn. So it was actually a much better system for the bank and also for the customer. And so that's why it happened. But what we're actually doing is just going back to where it well, was. Well, the, the churn's a worry, right? Correct. <laughs> that's a, a real pain. I think that's a pain for, for everyone. For everyone. Yeah. The banks don't want that. No one wants that. Um, the problem is that's probably not, 
That's not what Labor are saying. And Labor are saying, look, go to flat fees, um, which is going to basically, <laughs> it means it won't happen. I mean, anything but else out of the Royal Commission that you thought was... Just on that, actually, um, I read an interesting blog by Stuart Weems this morning. Yep. Um, and in if anyone's listened to our episode with him back in episode 39, I think it was, Stuart's a broker, but also a financial planner and, and, and he understands property. So it's, it's nice talking to somebody who has, who's got a great grasp of all of these areas. And this is a, unfortunately the problem with a lot of this policy is that it comes out of a very narrow understanding. And I think, um, and I don't know a lot about it, to be honest. And so I, I've always recommended brokers and, um, and, you know, your, your, a lot of Chris's comments in LinkedIn and, and following the Royal Commission and all the rest of it. So I've been looking further into it and I read this interesting um, thing and it was and he came up with um, alternatives for, you know, ways in which I guess policymakers could look at different ways of doing this. And one that he came up with, which I thought was great, was basically you can give the consumer the opportunity to opt out of that trail and commission. And so therefore, but it's not immediate. So it has to be over a two year period. And so if the, if the consumer says to the bank and the banks drive this, you know, like, do you want to opt out? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was because obviously the broker's not providing ongoing service and value and all that sort of stuff. And so then there's a year for them to make good. And if they don't, then they tick it again and then they get out of it. So there's an incentive there for the broker to actually nurture those relationships, provide that ongoing value. I mean, that's just one, I'm not necessarily saying that's the best one, but it just shows that you can actually apply some thinking to this and put more nuanced, um, changes in place that, that will actually ultimately make the industry better, be a better outcome for consumers and actually not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's actually a smart option. You yeah. can actually easily do that. Yeah. There you go, Stuart. So go. <laughs> <laughs> Start lobbying. Yeah. Sorry, back to you, Nerida. We're not here to bang on about what everyone else has been writing. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an impact on the property market. I think you're, 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 how your assessment there around people thought that it was going to be a much tighter on lending, um, it's not the case, you know, and I guess that's the that's a big kind of plus, I guess, to the property market. I mean, what is real estate comedy seeing out there with parts of the market? And are we starting to see, you know, certain pockets, you know, start to list a lot more that you see that, you know, there is a bit of a problem in certain pockets where there's so many on the market that are, are staying on the market. You know, I type in Rosebury in units into, you know, yeah, real estate market, yeah. and you'll see there's 700 or 900 mm. um, <laughs> and they're not selling. So yeah. I then add in Alexandria in there and I had mascot in there and now I'm up to 3,000 apartments on the market. Mm. So are you seeing problems like this? Can you name any that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, certainly lot high development areas in Sydney are, are pretty challenged. And, you know, when we, you know, we talk about views per listing a lot and, you know, a, a very high view per listing would be eight, 9,000 views per listing. Um, average would be sort of 4,000. Um, Sydney Olympic Park is seeing two, 250 views per listing. Yeah, I wonder so, why. Yeah. O- o- <laughs> well, this one's before Opal, actually. Really? Yeah, this is last year. So. Wow. Um, so, yeah, and Opal, you know, I can't even imagine what that's mm. doing to, to views per listing. Is that a negative? So, <laughs> is that, could I'll it even be positive? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we draw that. Yeah. Although there'd be people looking as a... Yeah. Curious. Yeah, curious, I'd say. So, um, so yeah, I mean, high development Sydney is ch- – I mean, Sydney's challenge. Like, there's not – the data that we're seeing is, you know, views per listing has been dropping for some time now and mm. there's pockets that, um, you know, new development areas are pretty challenged. Um, new development areas primarily that aren't within existing areas. So, you know, like DY at the moment actually doesn't look as bad because there's – you know, there's still lots of activity yep. in that area compared to, say, Sydney Olympic Park, which is purely a new new development mm. area. Yeah. So do, Sydney is. Do you Sydney's distinguish challenges. between the two in your data? Or we is we it really can. Just suburb? Yeah, we can. We, we we look a little bit at um, highest views per the highest number of views for development areas. So we we will look at that. But I I have I have looked at it in the past. So I have to have dig that data out. <laughs> but it always it, amazes me that and you did draw that distinction that that you've got developments in areas where there's existing stock. So therefore that that's going to mask or, mm. or dilute the, the uh, interest. Negativity or well, whatever. Do, yeah, it's yeah. going to dilute both the positivity of the existing stock and the negativity of the new stock. Um, so that sort of changes the story a little bit. And then you've got Olympic Park, which is pretty clear, you know, mm. it's just 250 Yeah, there's per, some per real listing. challenges there. Yeah, um, yeah Rosebery would be a very interesting <laughs> number. But um, I think that that's really, really interesting stuff because I think – I don't know. It's a weird one. I mean, 
you've got all these sales data that actually is price data is due is actual transactions, you know, so that's ultimately what happened. And then I think, you've got, yeah, although you have to be careful with pricing data for new because for apartments in particular, you, you often will find apartment values go up and <sighs> they're in areas where it's just new stock. Yes. So you fact, kind of look, you look at, oh, apartments are amazing. Let's invest in them. But, you know, really it's just. Oh, God, yeah. I, I saw this. In terms of the developer incentives that are factored no, in? No, just or... because they're new. Yeah, <laughs> so there's you, a premium you pay for new, yeah. so the price goes up. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, you're getting yeah. a price And so then the median, a... it's the same thing as the house and the land suburbs. So yes. you, get that, you get that push up in value. So if you actually looked at Sydney Olympic Park values, they look quite good. Yeah. You know, but it's because yeah. it's, it's all Kira new Wee development. topped the list. So the Herald comes out every quarter with their, their four little tables. There's the, the top 10 or top 20 suburbs for growth in houses and apartments and the top bottom 20 for top 20 for loss or the bottom 20 um, for houses and apartments. And Kirui topped it for apartments, 15.5% growth in a falling market. The rest of Sydney has gone down 10%, but Kirui, if you buy an apartment, has gone up 15.5%. And it's like, how can they publish that? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and not or at least like, footnote it all. Yeah, exactly. I it's I excruciating. Just, I know, it is excruciating. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I agree. So when I... Tell clients, I do tell them to go to real estate company to you and I play around on it and go into the, but I don't love, I don't really like the buy tab, mm. you know, like the, I, or the, you know, or the lease tab. I do look there sometimes, but I always look at the sold tab. Yes. And yeah. The sold tab's mm, really interesting. Because yeah. the sold tab's a fun bit, right? <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. you go, well, I'm here actually, this is actually what's happening. Mm. Not what the real estates are, you know, under quoting and potentially putting price guide or price reduced must sell. There's all these new low, like. No, pr- not price, mm. but all these great selling tips now, um, which is quite <laughs> funny. Um, but, I mean, the sold taps where you're really going to get the, the source, right? Because you can actually see a date. Yeah. You can see a price. You can go on your map. You're depressed when you look three years ago. Um, yes. <laughs> Why but, did I buy that? but it's interesting, though. Like, And the, the problem is, though, is, is how much stuff's going on there and what's not on there. And I guess how is, is real estate company kind of tracking what's selling off market, what percentage are we actually representing? You know, have you got that, those type yeah, of stats? we would for sure. Like it's, um, but I mean, it's one of the challenges we have is self-reporting yep. as well. Mm. So, um, so auction clearance rates are really interesting because, um, they're self-reported and something selling after auction would be classified as an auction sale. Mm. So, yeah, so when you say a lot selling of, after auction. So just say it doesn't sell under the hammer, yep. So which is an auction sale, yep, yep. but they go away and negotiate for a few days and three oh, right, days later. Okay. Yeah, that would, be, that would generally be classified as Oh, a, that's interesting. Mm. So that yeah. is screwing it. So when you actually look at data from the value of general that says auction, sold at auction, they're actually quite small properties sold. Anyway, that's an aside, but yeah, but we can, but yeah. <laughs> but we can actually, we can, but yeah, the, the self-reporting is a yeah. bit of an issue. So, um, yeah, we, 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 we do rely on agents telling us exactly what happened and they, they, not that they're lying. It's just maybe they just don't think it's that important. They'll just tick a box and. And does every yeah. property that gets listed on the buy go to the sale? Sold, yeah. I mean, we, if we, if people lost? say they don't want it price on there, we, we, yeah. we don't. So, but it's still yeah. in there as price not disclosed. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, mm, I oh, encourage yeah, sure. buyers, obviously not our clients, we've got, you know, logins and various things, but certainly anyone that wants to know, well, how do I research sales and property? I always say go into realestate.com.au and other portals and look in their sold mm. and check the date um, yes. as well. But look at the floor plans and, and, and really go do dry buys or preferably if you're actively looking, you've actually seen the property yourself anyway. That's when it's really um, valuable. And keep an absolute tab and keep get a spreadsheet and actually mm. track these sale prices and actually and then whenever you're looking at a property, assess how that one compares to the one that you're looking at buying. And and obviously adjust for market, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot in there. But, you know, it used to be that, that you could pull up a list and it, it went back years and there was no date on it. You really had to go digging to find the date. It's like you're, oh my God, that was a bargain. It was like <laughs> it was two years ago. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or creating a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Narita, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. Um, I, I guess people trying to play the market is mm. one that I, 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 I kind of question. And I think, um, you know, if you're an investor, 
being very, very well educated and buying not because you think the bottom of the market has happened or the market's going to continue to grow forever is, is really important. And, mm. um, you know, a friend of mine, they, they owned a home in Elwood and the, the husband decided 2014, Elwood, um, Elwood had peaked had to sell the family home and, you know, Elwood obviously kept growing for another three years and, you know, they got priced out and, you know, like that's, that's things that I'm like, especially with the family home, I'm like, why with the family and home? And they didn't buy back in, they no, just rented. No, they oh, were waiting. I love it. They I mean, so waiting. I don't love it. That's no, so, so sad. awful. But I, I yeah. you know, I just think, well, why? You know, not with the family home. Don't mess with the family home for a mm. start. Um, but even investors, you it's know, like. It's a big gamble. It's a big gamble. Well, they just yeah. think they're smarter than everybody else. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know. I have so much data and I, you know, I, mm. I quit. I'm so, you wouldn't I'm make so that cautious. Call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so mm. cautious. Um, but Especially the other, house in Elwood because it's a quality asset. Yeah, mm. it's in a good location. suburb. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. You know, and Just chances. Just near St Kilda for anyone who doesn't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and chances are if you sell out of that, um, and let's say they do time it, uh, you might win, might bank the money, get 3% on it, pay tax yeah. on it, and then... Yeah, you, you, what you hope, hopefully they Well, you wouldn't be paying tax on it if it's your own home. Yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah. Well, no, like if you had put that money I'll in the bank. I'll pay tax on the 2% oh, yeah, in the cash. Oh, yeah, you don't nothing. 2% interest you get on it. Yeah, that's right. And then once Put you, it into Bitcoin, maybe. Well, that's <laughs> right. You that can right. gamble it even, speculate even more. But you're right. Like that's, I've seen that time and time again. It's a great and, Dumbo. And I think a lot mm. of clients have sold out the market in the last, you know, year or so. And want to sit on the fences and the yeah, challenge but that's is a little different the last year or so the market's actually peaked right well i i met many people in yeah, my office wait until you see it right yeah yeah <laughs> but i met many people happening? in my office in 2014 15 16 saying oh we sold out you know a year ago two years ago whatever because we didn't think that it could get any better and it did and we didn't buy back in and now we're priced out we can't afford our old house back mm, yeah, yeah you know, that's, sad. that's terrible but it it's happened sad. a lot and it's happening at the moment in the sense that um, you will see people making decisions based on their take of, you know, whether it has mm. or hasn't bottomed and all that sort of stuff. And I tell you what, from investors' point of view, if ALP do get in and get all their changes in and you don't actually buy an investment before that happens, if you were thinking about it, I'm not saying you should rush just because of it, but if you weren't thinking about it, you were going to get stung by the capital gains tax at the end and then you're going to wish you bloody did act now instead of actually trying mm. to pick the bottom of the market. So, you know, long term, and this is what housing... Or, or I should say investment, property investment decisions need to be taken with a very long-term yeah, view. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, you know, there's knee-jerking because of what's happening in the short term. I, I don't think it ever really um, bodes well, does it? Mm. Uh, I mean, the other one that I think, you know, people will get caught out is those people that amass very, very quickly. Mm, yeah. And particularly in Sydney, you know, you could see a lot of people with their interest-only loans, you know, mm. gearing themselves up to the eyeballs and, mm. you know, one, one month vacancy in one of their housing, to, yeah. you know, could lead to a... It'll collapse in oh, their whole portfolio. So yeah. it's, yeah. you know, I think that that too. And, you know, when you talk, you know, I know those investment magazines love the one to 30 properties Ooh, they in do. five years. And I always like shut up when I see those articles. I'm like, they, they've, they've, they've ridden the market and it's been pure luck yep. that and they've bank, been the able to do it. But, yeah, and the banks have played a part, definitely. So, you know, the banks have been, you know, part of that journey. You know, they're on risk on, they had mm. big borrowing capacities. You know, the way you could play the system with valuations um, and revaluing and getting equity out easily. And, you know, it was all, all amazing. If you cut back their strategy, it's been bank credit and it's been interest only. And so, you know, bank credit got cut 40% drop in investor borrowing capacities over the last, slowly over the last four years, chopping away at it. Mm. Um, and then interest only loans basically got hit because you can't refinance now and your five years interest only is coming up. And so a lot of these people who built big portfolios are scrambling because they can't refinance and they can't extend their interest only And period. also and if you're in Sydney, the values have dropped. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's uh, pretty messy. And well, you can't right. run away from the debt because even if they've done, you know, you know, they, thought, they think they're smart and they've gone, well, I've uncross-secured them and you, well, then if you do make a loss on a property, you've got to pay that money back. So you actually just hold on to poor property uh, and it starts to get, Bad quickly. So I think actually fundamentally and all of that, that's a positive thing that we've had some changes so that that actually is a disincentive. You that. can't actually Perfectly. do that anymore. Yep. Thank you so much, Nerida, for your time. Uh, I think we have run a little over. Yeah, that's a good episode. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> we've got lots of meat in there and we covered a, quite a lot of uh, at the gamut and we got some great insights from you. So thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank Thanks for having Cheers. me. We want to make you a better elephant rider and this week's elephant rider training is... 
Well, we just had a really, really interesting uh, conversation with Nerida all around data and um, what it means and also the type of data that is out there, you know, easily available and readily available to all sorts of consumers and why we need to be careful, okay? So one of the things that everybody loves is the top 10 list and we talked about that and we all love the idea of hotspotting, what's going to be the next market to take off. And so really we've laboured this point in many previous previous episodes, but I guess one of the things that I just want to remind you of now in relation to this particular episode is the deep research required in order to make sure that you are doing the right thing for yourself before you take any notice of those hot spotting lists. Now, for starters, you want to make sure that if it is a hot spot, it's going to be a long-term player, not a short-term player. Okay, so you really got to look at the fundamentals and I've talked about this many, many times. You've got to look at the economic fundamentals of an area. You've got to look at the uh, employ- employment and make sure there's a good diversity of employment. You've got to look at incomes and you've also got to look at population growth. But the thing is, and this is the big thing, once you've got those fundamentals right, you've picked an area that's actually a good solid area and will be great for long-term growth, then you've got to make sure you get the asset selection right. If you get that wrong then you can blow it. Now, if you are going for investor stock, right, and that's where people get trapped buying brand new, for instance, then you're going to undermine all the good work you've done in choosing a good location. So really, you've got to understand what drives that local market, the individual market. You've got to make sure that there's more owner-occupiers in that area than there are investors. And you've got to make sure there's more owner-occupiers buying at that time as well than there are investors because the investors are those who actually push up a boom. So when you see that balance tipping over, say 30%, of investors buying in a market at any particular time, that's a point at which you really need to get a bit nervous around that because beyond that, it's really potentially prices being inflated by investors rather than owner occupiers. So the last thing I want to say about hotspotting is that if it is in an area that is not necessarily predicted to have long-term growth, i.e. it doesn't have those long-term fundamentals underpinning that sustainable growth, then you have to have an exit strategy. You have to understand that you're buying in, you're wanting to make a quick gain and then you've got to get out again and you've got to time that and not wait for the market to peak. You've got to get out before it peaks. Uh, so they're just a couple of important things to think about when you are looking at these hot spotting lists. Tune in for our next episode when we interview Susie Jacobs. Now, Susie Jacobs is a little bit hard to put into a box, really. She's sort of a business coach, I guess, maybe the best way to describe her. She may be better known amongst female business owners because she established She Business and sold it a couple of years ago, but is very well known in that space. Now, she has since then set up a business called Finesque, which is almost like a financial concierge service aimed at women, although Susie does explain it's not just for women, but she does explain why she set it up and the different conversations that we need to be having about money. But particularly in this episode, we're talking about personal responsibility. Now, when it comes to money or property and and or property and business, these are big, costly decisions that we are making. Costly can be very rewarding or costly can be extraordinarily damaging if we get wrong. So, Taking personal responsibility and getting advice from the right sources and then knowing what to do with that advice is very, very important. So it's a very interesting episode and we encourage you to join us. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. The Elephant in the Room property podcast is recorded at the Sydney Sound Brewery. This week's podcast was recorded by John Resk. Editorial by Gordy Fletcher. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.